almost missed recording that. That'd be bad. So basic thing, as we know, seems obvious, traits are inherited from your parents. You do not just show up out of nothing. Morphology comes from down from your parents. And that system is not just a 50-50 blend. Because this was the first thing that people would always kind of take a jab at with blending. Siblings are different. And you can tell that in this case with a nice, oh, I don't want to leave the run towel. There we go. You can tell that with a, just a coat color set of genes, right? You're different than your sibling. The pass down is close. You have the same parents. But the information that you got from each parent was a different mishmash of each one. So we talked about this Lamarck guy. He was like, an organism can change its phenotype just right now. Not, not impossible. And we'll see how that's possible. It's kind of cool. But it's really not the pattern that you typically are going to observe. And then the next one, you might be wondering what this means. You just thought that the physical traits that existed just passed down every time. So to test this, we took a rat. We chopped her tail off. She had babies. Rats, babies had tails still. So that one's out. Kind of sad, but had to prove our, prove our point, I suppose, right? Now, it, uh, this is sadly not my last Among Us example, I'm sorry, but they're just so fun and colorful. But essentially, pieces of each parent, a random 50%, but at least a whole set of 23 chromosomes comes down from each one. This is colorfully visualized right here. And as we kind of talked about, we'll, we'll get into dominant recessive, but that's not quite the, the big thing today. Now, the main way that I can test you on this, on these concepts is going to be, what is a key difference between mitosis and meiosis, for example? Or more likely, you will see the clinical exam style question, what is not a difference between mitosis and meiosis? There's three ways that you can always address those questions. Three true things or one thing you know to be false. A couple key things you can take away even from a smaller picture like this. There's a crossing over phase in, my, in meiosis. You've probably been introduced to that either through AP or 105 here. That's just a cut and dry thing that does not happen in mitosis. You do not exchange information in mitosis at all. If you did, they wouldn't be cloned cells, right? Equally, final products are going to be distinct. Mitosis from one cell produces two clones. Meiosis from one cell will produce four unique gametes, little haploids, one N. One N meaning only one set of the 23 chromosomes, two N meaning two of those sets, one from mom, one from dad. And sometimes cartoons are not always going to visualize how this looks because um, drawing out all 23, I think, has always helped me because you get a lot of textbooks that it's like, oh, here's four chromosomes, um, you know, good luck, infer the rest of them. So the better you can feel about how the math is passing down, it's going to be okay. Now, one trick, and uh, so when you're visualizing mitosis and meiosis and stuff, this is a trick and it's not, it's not 100% true, but it's something that helped me just concretely remember this. So remember with S phase, that is a doubling of DNA, right? So if you really need to, because this isn't a proper notation, but it's a shortcut. If you want to say that a 2N cell goes to 4N after that S phase, just to keep the math in your head a little easier, and then splits into a 2N and a 2N cell, you can visualize that if you want. If visualizing S phase as two goes to four and then splits down, I always think that keeps things a little straighter. Now, biologically, that's not what's happening, but I like that notation just for myself when I'm learning this.
Wow, blue on blue maybe wasn't a great choice, huh? Not bad. Okay. And you can split into four 1N individual cells at this point. Okay. So as far as concrete math, they are pretty, there's pretty blank differences between the two. And again, this is where it all leads. Now we're going to approach this from the left side of this equation. The two pieces and how these two became formed. Last class, we talked about this one and this process. Copy that genome, make a big organism. It's these ones right here. And again, I like this image because it does visualize you show up with 23 chromosomes on one from mom, one from dad, put them together, we're good. Now it is a random concoction of half of each parental genome that you will receive. That randomness is not repeated the second time your parents had a child and gave you a sibling. Now the key thing here, and this is gonna apply obviously to any biomed, anything like that, but it really, we'll see how later, meiosis is the, the key point of this is to get variation in populations. Variation allows you to survive. Now, broad speaking, variation allows populations to have offspring that can be emergent to disease or resistant, emergent to drought, maybe. So this whole song and dance to get to this point to mix offspring, it's very important as far as making at least one or two survivors in a population if some catastrophe happens. Populations without variation, they don't last as long. Now, strictly back to the genes, what exactly is variation? Now, in one case, we're looking at same gene right here in these little highlights right here, right? This purple and white. So in the same chromosome, so we can call this if we wanted to, we could say this is on chromosome 13 of this plant, right? Here's the one in the maternal, here's the paternal chromosome. This is where the idea of homologous chromosomes come from. So the plant has a chromosome 13 from mom, the plant has a chromosome 13 from dad. They're homologs because they're not exact copies. For about 99%, and that 10th that difference can be alleles. There can be small differences in genes. Maybe a single change of one of those A's, T's, C's, or G's. It suddenly takes you from a gene that can produce purple color to a gene that can only produce white color. Now, we'll get into the molecular side of why this happens a little bit, but I may as well introduce it now. What you're looking at in this case, let's say this is a gene for a pigment in the flower, this purple gene. What the allele, the different version of this gene for the white flowers is, is often. This is a defunct copy. Recessive genes are often broken versions of the original gene. Now something still shows up. So they're not necessarily producing a white color. They have simply lost the ability to produce the purple. The word defunct, bad, deleterious, if you want to get crazy. Recessive genes at the molecular level are often just broken versions and they are a blank slate. Now, as far as dominance recessive goes, this makes a little more sense why one purple copy shows up purple, right? You only need one copy, you're going to make the pigment, we're good. You need two broken versions of that white allele to actually have a white flower in this case, hence recessive. Okay. So this variation, differences in genes, this is the first set of variation that we are like deciding between offspring in this case. And again, this is just a nice little visual showing that each full sibling, although they are quite alike, that mix was still different from each parent. You are about 50% alike to a full sibling.
Now, the reason for this comes down to three key mechanisms. Meiosis has these steps. The two first steps in red up there are the mechanistic important steps. The last one is sort of just a numbers game. That's, that's a little bit of a quicker slide. And I imagine that you've somewhat seen these, these concepts a little bit before. I'm not gonna speed through, but hopefully I'm not going too slow. But the reason why you get 50% difference in siblings is that amount that you pass down is a random 50% from each parent. And let's see that randomness. We talked about metaphase in the cell cycle. This is when the chromosomes line up 1v1 and they decide which way to go. Now let's imagine in blue in this setup right here, let's imagine that blue is going to be the paternal set of chromosomes. Because remember, you're starting in a cell with meiosis with a full deck of cards, right? In this first metaphase, you're gonna decide as you split the first time, it's going to be an uneven split of maternal and paternal chromosomes. So this could be chromosome eight, this could be chromosome nine, and this could be chromosome 10, for example. Again, it's only gonna be able to visualize these three right here in this little animation. But this random chance of which are you gonna give the, your maternal or paternal pair to your offspring? Now remember, this ultimately is a decision. If you're gonna talk about this full split down the line, what you're really doing is looking at the math of how much of each grandparent you are from each parent then, right? So if this is the parent performing meiosis, the grandparents, the paternal and maternals listed right there came from their parents. That's the future offspring that we're talking about is grandparents a little bit. Now to cut and dry this a little bit, this is just a little, little piece that I always like to practice with a little bit. So imagine that paternal is in blue, maternal's in red. They can line up any way they want. And thousands of cells are doing meiosis constantly and they're producing random switches and sets each time. So each one is like a coin flip. Imagine the odds you would need to flip a coin 23 times to land on tails each time, right? To make a full maternal versus paternal split, right? And it's like never gonna happen almost. The random combinations that you can get are close to that many possibilities, just, sorry, 8 million up there, there you go. The randomness of just deciding what the maternal paternal split of your meiotic cells is gonna be, that's a, an immense amount of randomness. And that's why if you had sibling number one over here and they received maybe this meiotic setup, sibling number two maybe received this meiotic setup, they're gonna be a little different, right? There's not as much, there's not full crossover there. That's close, but it's not hundred percent. That's why you eventually get down to 50 in the numbers. All right, so a little question time. Anybody ever bit into a banana and cracked your teeth open, right? It'd be a really unpleasant thing to eat. How did we remove these giant shotgun shell seeds from bananas to get what we have today? We synthetically made bananas to have an odd amount of chromosomes. Bananas that you see in the store have three copies of each of their chromosomes. They're engineered this way. It's not, uh, it's not the same engineering you hear of with some deeper molecular stuff with agriculture. Basically, you can get to the point where you have a one end banana, breed that with a two end banana, and lo and behold, you can get a three end. 
Now the process to get a haploid banana, it's not impossible. Now the problem here is that you can't evenly assort at the metaphase plate here. Let me show you what I mean by that. So if this is my metaphase plate right here, the cell has no way to know or decide. Am I gonna, if I'm sending two over here, so remember we have a total of three for each chromosome. So we'll just say, see one, two, three, four. The cell has no way to decide which way it's gonna send two or one. And that's gonna jam up everything. Those gametes aren't gonna take, they have too much DNA or too little DNA in certain parts. And so this odd split is never going to create a fertile seed. Because if you don't give it a regular set of genes, it's never gonna be able to produce that. Now, there is the off chance, you know, that one in something million, that by chance, like all of all the chromosomes line up twos on one side and all the one chromosomes line up on the other. Maybe you might get a seed in a commercial banana, maybe. But it's not likely. Because you're doing this not just four times, but I think bananas have an actually pretty large amount of chromosomes, surprisingly. But each time that you make this uneven split, you're not gonna make a, you're not gonna go through meiosis very well. It's gonna ruin it. Because down the line, remember you have to split these again. And so a lot of cells are gonna end up just as blanks or with double the amount they need. And it's never gonna work. Oops. Okay. So the banana example and sterility from an odd numbered genome is sort of a, a uh, functional example of independent assortment being, being important. I had a whole place to draw that. I just went to the whiteboard, shoot, okay. Okay, so a lot of the times, so I'll throw up slides like this and say remember, because it's not anything new, it's just kind of what we've been talking about. Now let's get into some more close knit, let's get into crossing over. This is more close molecular style variations. This is where like some serious magic happens. Now you have different versions of genes. That's not the case for all your genes. Plenty of, plenty of us in this room have the same exact gene copy for both parents and share that across the population. Some alleles are very rare, but plenty of alleles have tons of variation. And if you switch around that variation during meiosis, you can increase the odds that this offspring might produce something unique. And by unique, I mean, doesn't look like the parents. Because in the, in the disease example, you want something that's so variable that even if the parents die from a disease, you might have produced a unique offspring that can survive. Okay, back in metaphase again, because we are aligned, chromosomes are in contact. Essentially, this is crossing over. So remember that you have two copies of the paternal, you have two copies of the maternal. That's why you see a total of you know, four right here, right? because you went through S phase one time to make copies. Okay, so zooming in here, this chromosome is pretty big. There's an A and a B gene, each one with a dominant and let's say a recessive allele version. The cut and dry thing that can happen is that the maternal and the paternal can form a physical union between one another. So remember, you are mixing genetic material here inside yourself. It's the genetic material from your mom to your dad, but in yourself from you. So the end result can be an exchange of genetic information before we do division. Now, a key point here that people get somewhat lost on. You're not just like flip-flopping DNA from all over the place. You're not taking anything from chromosome seven and putting it on chromosome 18, no. You are only ever going to exchange a piece of a homologous chromosome that matches the 
basic structure of the one you're coming from. Equally, crossing over is always going to happen between the maternal and paternal pairs. You wouldn't cross over with the copy you made way back over here. You wouldn't cross over on these two because they're the same thing. You're always going to cross over maternal and paternal. Sorry, this thing's like all over the place. There we go. Okay. Now, in this class, we will head into some deeper versions of crossing over. We'll see how we have to apply it in some cases. Today, and for, let's say, quiz one, think of it as your source of variation. Okay, and this is one of the sources of variation that we introduced about 10 minutes ago for why meiosis can produce different siblings because of different haploids. This is one of those pieces. The alignment is another piece. So this randomness plus this randomness gives us what we have at the end of meiosis for recombinant haploid chromosomes. Well, of each chromosome that's going to happen. Now, luckily, this is posted. I'll never, I'll never just bring up a red slide like this without, without giving you something to reference. Now, the example to the left here is just one set, like we saw in the last slide with crossing over. Remember that this is happening with chromosome one, it's happening with chromosome two, all the way up to 22. Not counting X and Ys and stuff, you'll see why later. So in blue, because I'm not gonna test you on it really, is the chiasma, that's the point of contact where crossing over can occur. At this point in, this, in, the, in the cartoon, the decision of which direction the maternal and paternal copies are going to go has been made, so they're aligned. Then they lay on top of each other and they start exchanging. You'll notice, too, that both independent assortment and crossing over have occurred before anaphase one. Nothing has split yet. We've not done the math to split once and then twice. That all happens, that all happens after you've like basically gotten up the variability up to 11. So all the variability stuff of meiosis happens well before you actually split. You don't have to know too much past this. Like that's why I like this, you know, image is because it kind of showcases that all the good stuff happens before the cell splits the first time. So in this case, at this decision, though, you've decided that your majority maternal is on the right, your majority paternal is on the left, but you exchange some pieces. So they're no longer quite the same exact copies you had before. These will split, as you can tell. So you can follow this one if you want over here. And then these are going to split again. Because remember, this is just a one version of that chromosome. Because again, we're, the cartoon can only follow one single chromosome. You can imagine this is chromosome 11, let's say, I don't know. Now, the thing in the randomness where this goes is that with crossing over, this is not just happening like it is up here. It's not just one little spot you know, maybe among the chromosomes, if you had to imagine how this is happening and why the randomness is amazing, it's happening all over the place in this thing. Because remember, these things are hundreds of millions of base pairs long. So these events are completely mishmashing, mishmashing these chromosomes. And they'll do it differently each time. And that's why the mishmash that one sibling gets is going to be different than the other. But for the purposes of learning it the first time, yeah. You can look at it as just a single segment exchanging a couple of times. You can apply it to big stuff and like thought later. All right, those are it. Those are the two big things. Last one, third one. There's a lot of gametes. That's a ton. There's like hundreds of millions of sperm per egg and it's totally random. It's totally random which egg is the one that's chosen and it's totally random which sperm makes it to that egg. 
just a lot. Now this is in mammals, so obviously the system can change depending on what you're, what you're after, but I believe the same thing could be applied to the idea with plant pollen, just poof, like everywhere. And like I said at the beginning, this one's a little easier intuitively. There's just the math is really big. So that's why the math goes as far as genetics, it would be very unlikely that you would be even close to more than 50% of your sibling, even higher than that, It'd be very unlikely because there's so many random chances. Okay. Now, wanted to talk a little bit, this is one of the first, this isn't mutation, something a little different. This is gain or loss of chromosomes. Now we first introduced this on Thursday, but I wanna give it an official name. And this is where you get those products. And this is something I frequently test on because it's a great example of how this process works. What this is called is a non-disjunction. When a set of chromosomes was meant to split normally one to two, if accidentally it pulls just both to one side instead of a good split, you have now doubled the genetic information, at least of this chromosome that we're talking about, over to one side, you've unevened everything. Now, as you can tell on the second division in our first example, so you can call this example number one right here, call this number two. In example number one, you've got two times the amount of genetic material the cell knows what to do with, and so it has to split those, see? So both one of these and one of these can go over here. Because the cell is not a smart thing. It's just going to split things as it sees them. So if you end up, because you're supposed to end up like this, supposed to end up with one copy of each chromosome. So if this is fertilized, because remember, if fertilized, another plus one chromosome is coming along from the other parent. That's where you get trisomy because you have one, two, and three. Now, similarly, this event will produce on the left side over here, a set of cells that are incomplete with that chromosome. Zero, can't split zero. So in this case, maybe there's no chromosome 11. That means that from the other parent, they're contributing a chromosome 11, but it's just one. Now, the bigger the chromosome, which means the lower the number, typically embryos can't survive missing one or gaining one. The amount of information lost or gained ruins the ingredients, usually. Now, example number two, everything's normal on meiosis one, and let's say this non-disjunction happens on the second division. So that means that you're gonna have two normal cells over here, but on this split, when you had two, both two went over here. And you'll get a couple new results there too. So on the basic level, a non-disjunction happening earlier is going to be worse. You'll produce more atypical cells. Now remember how I introduced that uh, banana that was one end. How did you make a one end banana? This is sort of blue text, but I can test on this just as a format. We can force this event to happen in the lab in small cells. And so that banana that we talked about, we can force its entire genome to be monosomy, one N. So non-disjunctions, this is your first look at damaging alterations. But again, technically they're a source of variation too. There's plenty of stuff, there's plenty of events that have happened even in our evolutionary past where one copy of something came with and it was a good thing, where we lost copy of something and that was a good thing. So there's always power, there's always strength, where there's weakness sometimes. Okay. All right, so you can kind of relax a little bit. There's two breaks in this class, but this is always a fun story. So people always had a really hard time with wolf packs 
why didn't certain wolves in the pack have any children? They were strong, they were fit, they would hunt, they were good, they were well respected in the pack. Was this what we call altruism in nature? Altruism being just selflessness for no other reason. Not quite. And the point written above is kind of goes on this. You care about your family because they're you inherently instinctually. Now humans are different, but if we're looking at nature, the reason wolves in a pack sometimes don't have offspring, and this comes down to math, is there are a certain set of circumstances, switches, and phenotypes that cause the wolf to not decide to have children. Now what that does is that his or her nieces and nephews that are being had by his siblings or her siblings can benefit from, let's say the wolf is altruistic right here, she goes out and hunts and brings back tons of food for the offspring. Her nieces and nephews grow up, her genes pass along more mathematically than if she had had her own children, tried to feed them, failed, they die, and everybody suffers because there's not enough food to feed that many. So mathematically, sometimes it makes more sense in nature for some members of social hierarchy animals to not have their own children but to push the genes and the children of their related family. Mathematically, that works out. And strangely, we only figured this out maybe like 10, 20 years ago, because before we always just thought, maybe that's just how wolves work and they're badass, but that's not entirely untrue. There's cool stories with wolves and stuff, and I'm a big domestication fan. So anytime you want to come in office hours, we can, we can go more on that. Okay. Basic concept here, like we kind of talked about, closer to relative, Close your DNA is. I would say that I think if you want to if you want to put a slap a word on it, I think third cousin is when things start to break down. That almost everybody can have a fourth cousin to almost everybody if you really wanted to break into family trees, because you got to understand the math of your ancestry is pretty big and deep and a lot of stuff. We'll get into sequencing when we get there. But the closer somebody is to relative, we got these little pieces right here. So let's say that's you, and let's say that's this relative right here. You're pretty close. But if you go all the way back in this orange line, you're looking right here. They've got way different pieces of their DNA. And that's a consequence of the 50% pass down rule each time. About 50% of your parent, or you, you lose about 50% each generation of how much you're related to that next one. So again, blue text, because they're never going to quiz you on this, to be honest. It's too abstract, and I don't think helpful, because it's something fun to think about if you want. So if you're right here, you're about 50% like your offspring. You're about 25% like their offspring. You're about 50% like your parents, and you're about 25% your grandparents. Now. To do cousins and aunts and uncles, you got to split that 50-50. Your mom is only 50% like your aunt, for example, her sister. So you got to split that again if you keep going that direction. So kind of just a fun thing to think about if you want to just do the math quick. Half siblings, kind of harder because <laughs> you got to think about meiosis. But it is technically break time. So you can think about, think about in your head what that math looks like for each one of these. And you also don't have to. I've been talking a lot, so you can take a break. Now's a good time for questions if you want to come up or find me and I can help.
not technically starting yet. Um, the quiz is kind of practice for the exams. It's kind of its role next week. Uh, do find yourself like a baby calculator because eventually we will come up against some some math eventually, and it always helps your like assuredness on a multiple choice to actually just do the math once in a while. Um, so yeah, bring a baby calculator. I have like five, so definitely don't count on me for one. You'll have to you'll have to look to the altruism of your classmates for their calculator in that case. Okay. So talking about meiosis, family variation. Given that family variation, and I would ask the same thing, just if I were right here, you would get, you would get mad if someone punched your sibling in the face, right? People, that's just an instinct, right? Like, no, no, hell, now no, like, right? You get after that. Question then becomes, when you swat a bee, why does the entire hive go nuts? Like full nuts. And it's because the way that meiosis and inheritance works in bees is a little different. Your siblings are more along the line of 75 to 87% you. So when one of your siblings gets struck, it may as well be your genes getting killed. That's why they go so crazy. This is a pattern in a lot of hive insects. And the reason behind this example goes, so it's blue, so it's not like I'm gonna like strictly need you to know about bees. It's not off the case that I could say something along these examples. V males are haploid. They only have one N. They didn't exist fine like this. That's okay. They just got one copy of every chromosome. It's fine. They don't do meiosis. Their sperm is just one clone copy of what they got. There's no crossing over. No crossing over, no independent assortment, no variation. That's why we call male bees drones. Now, female bees, they're diploid. They can do meiosis, they can have variation, all's well. So when you fertilize and you make new female bees, which comprise the colony, Zero in on this one first. If you have a diploid queen that mates with a non related male, notice that the male copy is 100% passing on to both his daughters exactly copy. So if a 2N female B, she automatically shares 50% with all her sisters, no matter what, plus 50% of her mom's contribution, which is going to be 25. See, humans are boring. This is why I like zoology, people. There's always way better examples. So the key to understanding this example is just to follow that genome given by the, the male. It is extremely, it's just 100% pass on. It's just complete, no variation. The only variation that's really gonna come is from the queen. This chromosome can go over here. This one will go over here. So you end because you start at 50% clone and the remaining 50% is a 50-50. Okay, now things get even bigger and this is why established hives are even more defensive is because if we start on this example over here instead on the right, if a queen's established and she's got drone sons out there, if this is a son of the queen already, it's gonna match one of her chromosomes pretty closely to meiosis product. So it's a little different, but the sons are gonna carbon copy themselves into the daughters. And yeah, it's mom and son, but they're insects. So these are 100% alike. The only variation that might show up is the remaining 50% of the queen. So in this case, you end up with 
only 12 and a half percent, so half of 25% variation left. So the sacrifice that bees made evolution wise, because this is lower diversity, and that's why they're a sensitive species, right? They don't react very well to new changes. But the strength is that if things are good and you're close to cloning almost, things keep staying good. So it's an exchange. Variation is, a, is power over change. Low variation is power to maintain your hold on the environment, whatever you've got. So a little bit of a mind blow. Again, with the recording, this is the reason those are up for as long as they are. And always remember, you can record me in class. And if you're smart enough, you can just record the video if you want. I don't really care. This is mainly to just keep people on track just because we unfortunately saw the evidence that people don't if their recordings are up all night. All right, so let's look at animal hybrids. I wish, that'd be hilarious. I don't know if I'd pet it, it'd be big, but it'd be really cool. <laughs> so people have seen animal hybrids before. Hybrids are a great way to look at meiosis and kind of the limits that we can reach on this. Now this isn't real, so let's just go over here for quick. So dog breeds are an excellent way to showcase Hybrid, hybrid genetics. Here's some really cool breeds here. The Utagon is something like a Malamute, Husky, German Shepherd, and Wolf or something, really cool. Puggles just, you know, you, get, you hate it or you love it, sorry. Pomsky, I, I don't know if that's real. German Husky, all kinds of fun stuff. You can see that features from each parent can come through sometimes, not all of them. And the cool thing with these hybrid siblings is that not all of them look alike. The blend at which, or the, uh, sorry, the meiosis combo that you get from each parent is different for these siblings more than it is your typical dog breed. I think this German Shepherd Corgi is fake image. I don't know, but you've seen some Corgi hybrids. They're, 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 they're pretty nuts. Okay. So remember how we talked about the sterile banana? That was because independent assortment, factor number one, can't happen. So when you make a donkey, Mate with a horse, you get a mule, a hybrid. Just in case, uh, cartoons. Now a mule cannot have baby mules. Mules are a single product. They end there. You cannot mate a mule with a mule. You can't even mate a mule with a donkey or a horse. So why does this happen? Now, this is a fully healthy hybrid. It's totally fine. It functions great. But if we look at the chromosomes that it's made of, I believe it's a, I think it's a donkey dad, usually in a horse female. These are not homologous chromosomes. The horse chromosome may have genes over here, donkey chromosome will have them maybe in totally different spots. And it's likely it just has a totally different chromosome at that spot. There's actually usually, there's not actually the same amount of chromosomes in either one of these either. So the horse's chromosome seven doesn't really look like the donkey's chromosome seven. So what happens here is that meiosis still tries to happen but if you try and cross over right here, it's totally unequal and you will exchange a gene for hoof size with a gene for fur color. And no gamete is going to end up being, coming out with a complete set of instructions. Because if crossing over fails, all of meiosis ends up failing. So we saw how we can, how an odd number of genomes can basically ruin independent assortment. Fully different genomes, although in union making an organism, they can't cross over together. They can't exchange equal parts of information. So nothing results, just chaos happens. Because remember, crossing over doesn't happen just once. It's happening thousands of times each time. You're making thousands of mistakes each time. So again, this is an example of why and how Wait, where am I going? Oh, I was there the whole time, sorry. 
This is an example of why and how this doesn't, uh, this is why crossing over can matter. So we got plenty of stuff that is actual hybrid. This is green text, but I'm going above it. Llama and a camel, lion and a tiger, a couple species of bees that, that didn't go well because they can make babies, oops. Zebra and a donkey, hooray. So sometimes hybrids can go on and make babies if, if, if their chromosomes are close enough. Now remember, this is kind of the big deal with dogs and wolves. Their chromosomes are still so alike, you can easily have a Malamute go with a wolf and they'll make hybrid babies. It's just always a separation thing with dogs and wolves for us, but we only separated them a few years ago. Okay, so as far as hybrids go, let's look into one last piece of science before we end today, and that is cloning. Cloning is sort of the culmination of mitosis and meiosis coming together, and we showed that we can do it synthetically. Now, fair warning on all this stuff. Um, we're not 100% good at cloning. It is possible. We're not perfect. So Dolly the sheep, this happened when I was a kid, and it was a big deal. First clone sheep ever to exist, first clone mammal to ever exist. And what you do for cloning, you take an egg from a sheep, you remove the nucleus. So no DNA from the original. You fuse the DNA from this sheep, and we can call this Dolly, you fuse the DNA up here with that empty cell that you emptied out. End up right here. And luckily, nature and cells, they're not, they don't know that they've just been swiped of their DNA. You implant that embryo even back in the same mom sheep that it came from that you sapped her DNA. And the sheep will emerge with DNA that you told it to use. In this case, they'll have that white face phenotype instead. That was Dolly. So what you have to do in this case, and what, what this really shows is that the genome of any cell, because Dolly cell came from a skin cell, for example, genome of any cell contains the full instructions. And if you put the instructions in a scenario where they're being told to become a zygote and then become an organism, they'll do it. Now, one caveat here, and this is one that I will kind of, well, actually we'll get to it. So in this case, we're not really looking so much at meiosis as like with variation. We're actually obviously looking at the opposite. We're saying, here's a complete set of instructions. Can a zygote form and undergo mitosis in this environment? And we know that it can. And we'll get into a couple of consequences, but obviously it's been talked about to say, okay, if we have a complete genome of something or tissue, something to use, right? Is it possible to bring some of these things back? Can you bring back a woolly mammoth, a dodo, a giant sloth, a Tasmanian tiger, or a saber-toothed tiger? It's not impossible. Let's get into a couple of limitations though, quick. Ooh, well, I always throw in this slide. This is from New Zealand. Islands breed really crazy evolutionary examples. This is green text, obviously. Those are moas, those birds that are being chased. They're about 16 feet tall. Hoth's eagle. Was, it, was an eagle that was no less from wingspan here, like to there, swooping down, eating 16 foot predator birds. Yeah, kind of scary. Kind of goes to, yeah, well, humans show up though and we kill everything. We, I don't think supposedly we didn't kill the host eagle, we just killed enough moas that they didn't eat anything anymore. And they got tired of eating humans, probably. Kind of cool. But again, extinct, and this brings up the argument, well, we shouldn't clone stuff, but if we have the tech to bring back critically endangered species or maybe even extinct species that humans caused, 
you start to get into a fun moral philosophy quandary of we did this damage, is it not our obligation because we can to do something about it? This is the black-footed ferret of North America. You probably have never seen it or know that it's from North America because we basically extincted them. They need, I'm sorry, that's not a word. They need prairie, they need specific environments and we turned a lot of that into farm. So is it our obligation in this case to do what we can to bring something back? Now, this is kind of outlined here. This is the same outline with Dolly the sheep, but basic concept. If you have a Pyrex that we went caused uh, to go extinct, and I think right now, what are we at with black rhino? Something like seven left, or I don't know, I can't remember the number, but some dismal, sad number. Is it not, if possible, I'm not saying this is cheap, but if possible, is that something, is that a route science should go to bring something back? For now, just tell me, this isn't for points, this is just like, cool, I mean, you should still do it because I you know, keep track of that and stuff, but um, let's go there. So, and this is a, this is an upvote, downvote thing. Don't, I can see when you downvote, so like, don't be mean and downvote everybody. <laughs> um, you can upvote ones that you like. Now you don't need to say why we want to do this one. Now the reasons I outlined, some of those were like moral or ecological reasons, but you're not saying somebody wouldn't pay good commercial money to see a dodo or Tasmanian tiger, or I'm trying to think of some other cool stuff. You could bring back that giant sloth from South America, for example. Oof. Oh no, is it not coming through? Let me see. Oh shoot. Oh, something. Hey, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, you guys have done your done your movie watching. Hmm, it's not going through anything but dinosaurs. This is going to turn into a bilateral argument with dinosaurs. So there's a good one that was recent. The the Yangtze River dolphin. Yeah, that was. I think what did they finally do a study and population counted it didn't really do super well. Now, pollination is a good one, and consider that with, would you make a version of a bee that is resistant to the issues that are currently plaguing bees, for example? Because if you wanted to make the argument, remember, because some, some people come, can come at this from a business perspective. If you make a park of brought back animals and you it's like millions of dollars and you put out into the field, this is how we can clone, this is the tech we use, this is really easy. Money can drive innovation for all the evils of, you know, money, 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 but it's usually something that, uh, that is a route. That is a route right now with rhinoceroses right now, is that there are farms, quote unquote, in specific parts of the African continent where people will saw off the horns, let them grow back and sell them and use that money to buy security, fences, everything it takes. But even then, sometimes is not quite uh, not quite enough. Now the coral reef thing, I hmm, I think that's possible. That one might be done. Go to Australia and see the coral reef before it goes away. <laughs> like that's that's my advice. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure. Anything but dinosaurs. I feel bad for dinosaurs. We'll actually see why we can't do dinosaurs. <laughs> so as we as you think about it, and there's a lot of good examples, and it's fun. I'm sorry, whoever put dinosaurs got downvoted. I think that the crowd worked against you. We've all seen too many velociraptors. But the cool thing is that this idea is not impossible. This idea is not out of the realm. And the idea of pollinator species, to be honest, I do, that's talked about more than you'd think. Specifically, if we could edit their DNA to give them a few advantages too. But we tried that with killer bees, didn't work tried to make a version of a bee that was good in the heat environment. Turned out it was just really angry and aggressive. Okay, so these are fun and it's good to kind of exchange, exchange ideas about why you'd want to do those a lot of the time too. So these are not always for points, for example, but I mean, I'll always kind of, you know, be able to share ideas and see where you're at with stuff. So that's good. So kind of like we've been covering, you know, the mammoth always comes up. 
And even, like I said, from a commercial perspective, people pay good money to see a woolly mammoth walking around. It'd be kind of cool. We have the full genome because we got frozen tissue too. So that's great. And the process itself is pretty good. And the main thing, and this is your intro to development with genetics and meiosis and stuff, you need to find something that's kind of like the original mother. You need to mimic that environment for development of the embryo as close as possible, or it won't work. This is what I would say is probably the biggest impact on the whole process of cloning that we just saw you need a surrogate mom that's close enough. So think about who this eliminates on our list, sadly. So if I had to say a red text for anything, this will come up later with development. You need the proper environment to tell the DNA what to do. The DNA alone can't do the whole thing. Sheep was easy because the sheep we just put into another sheep. Perfect environment. So yeah, sorry to the dinosaur, the pro-dinosaur party people. The, even if we found DNA, we have nothing close enough to a surrogate mom. Because remember with the whole birds from dinosaur thing, that still was a split hundreds of millions of years ago. So we'd still be talking a lot of difference. So even if we magically came up with some velociraptor DNA and we're like, this is gonna be a great idea. Yeah, we don't have a mom for Velociraptor here. Sad face. All right. Next part. People don't know this. It's a pretty substantial market for dog cloning. A lot of people in here probably had a dog die. I have. It's not fun. I'm a big dog person. It's a bad, bad deal. Most headlines got made when Barbara Streisand had a dog down here. Samantha. Very cute. Wasn't ready to let that go. Had DNA of her. Made three more, commissioned three more. Now, first deal about commercial cloning and why, yes, this process is possible, but it's not exactly a pretty thing, is that the cells that the original Samantha gave dog to become these new clones, they were seven years old. They're seven years full of damage already. That means that when these were born, they came seven years aged as far as your DNA. Your DNA progressively has a damage on it. Your telomeres, you will we'll see those later. The ends of your chromosomes eventually lose their, their length. So these clones are typically seven years genetically old already. So not a great fair shake. And the other thing, do you think that these three organisms were just the first three times we, they tried this and it just worked both all three times? Science usually fails quite a bit. You're probably looking at 20 organisms that came out, died a horrific death, and he moved on to sample number 15. Cloning is not an exact process. So when you see and get excited about stuff like this, remember there's a certain failure cost to science that people don't inherently tell you about. One last thing that we've talked about, we have a full Neanderthal genome, accessible. Neanderthals were different and we'll get into this idea. They were a hominid human species. There were six hominid human species when Homo sapiens emerged and dominated the rest of the world. Everywhere Homo, Homo sapiens touched, that was it. All 90% of large mammals died and every other human species we encountered eventually lost out one way or another. So is it possible to bring back something like this, and then what a kind of ethical weird stuff would happen there, right? Neanderthals are technically human, but culturally you would have to contend with, I would say the spiritual side of a decision like that, to say the least. So not endorsing this. I would actually think that'd be pretty terrifying. But us, and then people always ask like, well, it can't be possible to keep clone humans, right? Of course it is. We're just like any other mammal. And there's, we have exact surrogates for what we would do, right? So tech like this is a good example of what's possible, what to think about, where we're at with genetics and cell bio. I'm definitely not trying to make a bunch of stormtroopers though, probably. So that's sort of the end for meiosis. Um, 
we have plenty of time and I want to save it. So why don't you, why don't you take a break for like a minute? We'll get a couple basic stuff, things out of the way, and then hopefully end a little early today. Oh yeah, now I can actually go um, through the examples in the poll everywhere. This is fun. A lot of these are really good. Oh yeah, and I know I put like little scraps of paper for you to write on today. Don't, we're not gonna do anything. Um, for the species that you chose, think about why it would be important if you only had money to bring back one species, why yours would be better the most important. That's sort of just like practice for like thinking and writing and stuff. Providing that why behind something always makes things a lot more powerful. Thing sucks. There we go. All right, so we are now finally at the point of here's a gene and here's Mendel and here's how this Mendelian system works. Now at the turn of 19th century, this power was discovered that there were units of heritability. We could track them, we could predict them. And some people started obviously saying we can manipulate this. And so one of the first scientists with it was basically just like, somebody soon in the future is going to try to regulate this. They're going to try and remake humanity. And they weren't wrong. This power holds quite a bit of potential in the eyes of people that would like to see a world that, um, you know, is sort of dictated in that case. It's a strange, strange thing. And historically, it's hard to remember so much, but... Good, so we've seen the gene, pieces that are important, obviously, DNA to RNA to protein. The DNA is what we track. It's what we just talked about with meiosis. Protein is ultimately what's gonna come forth of that product and do something. That's the thing that's phenotype, that's what we can actually see. So if you had to say it, you could almost say that protein equals phenotype and DNA equals genotype, almost. Maybe an oversimplification. Just like we just saw, proteins are phenotype. You can imagine genotype being the DNA instructions. Now we'll be honest, out in the wild, in medicine, anything, phenotype counts. Phenotype's what does something, at least in the life of that organism. Genotype can play a role later because it is the storage and the pass on of information. Technically, you do not pass on phenotypes. Okay. So given that DNA is what passes, Any change in this instruction leads to something different. So if you have a normal gene and you got a typical protein to come with it, and like we talked about what is in a recessive allele at the true DNA level, it is a broken version of the gene usually. 
So if you have any change, like we see right here, can easily end up with two routes that essentially a lot of the time have a pretty much the same outcome. An abnormal non-functioning protein, or it has a completely strange effect. That's possible, but unlikely. Or the thing just is broken beyond repair, essentially deleted. Because what happens is your body can tell if a protein's weird, it just gets rid of it. So even a small change like this can make us an allele. So again, the main thing here, because we've covered structure a lot before, is that alleles are different versions of these instructions with, in our case, with Mendelian recessive being damaged ones, ones that can be masked because they're really not doing anything. Okay, last slide for today, don't worry. What you're looking at is phenotype. I have, yeah, I do want everything up there. You're looking at phenotype and this is the pattern that we, that we saw, is that that purple factor, whatever it was, in this case, we now know it was an allele and a gene, it was dominant over the white factor, the allele. So when you mated, and remember what true breeding is, it means that the purple parents in this came, case came from pure purple parents, pure white parents for the white flowers. When you mate them, 100% are purple. And when you mate these plants with themselves, that's when we started to see this three to one ratio. And again, talked about it, but that's not blending, is it? If it was blending, you'd really see the, like a pink flower immediately in that F1 generation. So I'll probably revisit this. But this is the difference between genotype and phenotype, what we were seeing. So imagine these are the offspring of that final generation we just saw. For every three flowers that are purple, there was one white flower. But it's under the hood with the genotype that counts in a lot of cases, at least for inheritance. With Mendel's system, we knew that there were units, these little genes. And with Mendel's system, and he actually figured this out, he knew that there was one and two of each. And that if you had a dominant one over a recessive one, the dominant one would pull through because it was an actively working gene. And it's only when you had not one, but two copies of that non-working gene did you get the non-working recessive phenotype in that case. So we'll start from here next time. Keep in mind what you see versus what's under the hood. Those can be different.